I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be talking about the wonderful series Rabbit Hole. We are joined by creators, showrunners, and directors, John Requa and Glenn Ficara. And I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the initial genesis of, of Keith or Sutherland's character at the, the, the center of this story, um, because I love the way that you've described how some of the development of his character started with asking the question of what would happen to someone who grew up in a space where trust is is a currency that isn't always given and what would the damage be even at this stage in adulthood of what that would look like which I think is such an interesting question to explore within the show with his character and I was interested in how kind of asking yourself that that sort of central question about your main character in turn informed a lot of the narrative structure that ended up falling into place around him good question um I don't know, John, do you want to start that? I mean, I, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, it's, it's a funny, an the answer sort of funny. Uh, it was before the Fablemans was, we even kind of knew that movie was getting made, but we had heard the story of Steven Spielberg and how he, uh, he, he had believed a narrative about his childhood that was not true about his father, his father leaving him and, and that, how that informed some of the greatest films of the 20th century you know what i mean i mean and and like that that struggle of a guy looking for dealing with the sort of like loss of his father as an artist really drove him and it made him who he was and so we we i said that is so interesting what if your life not only is is there a major lie in your life which is but what if your whole life is based on a lie and you build your life around that lie and then the person, you know, I, I, you've seen you've seen up to episode six, the person who uh, he thought was dead, who he thought was persecuted and who thought be, for his radical sort of theories uh, and and ended up being, getting killed or committing suicide was, in fact, still alive. And so that that was sort of the very beginning of it. You know, that was the, the genesis of it. And the idea of truthfulness plays into so many aspects of even just the experiences of watching the show for audiences because there's so many times where we don't know yet if certain characters are telling us the truth as as a viewer or not and i i think it's 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 very clever the way that you've kind of intentionally crafted a lot of direction and misdirection in terms of the experience of that and so how did you work to to shape the scripts in a way where it's not just the characters themselves that have that sense of well is this person being truthful or not but then that it also kind of like translates into something that the audience are experiencing and, and becoming very involved in as well. Yeah, we went into it uh, thinking it'd be interesting uh, to go into a show where people kind of knew everybody was lying and you have to kind of root in something and and uh, and, and it's part of the fun of it. And also uh, part of the fun of it, at least for us, is that we, as the filmmakers are also uh, sometimes lying. So uh, it, it, you know, it, it's it's a sort of a motif, uh, I think, uh, that, that that echoes to the central theme. And you know, you were talking a little bit before about the experience that that, that John Weir has of learning that his dad was never dead, and kind of when in his life he found out. And then there's the subsequent experience of when does the audience find out that detail as well. Did you always have a sense of where narratively you felt like that needed to land for the audience to discover that piece and to to bring him in as a central character? Or did you play around with, if we put it here in this episode, then it's going to create this experience. And if we put it here, then it's going to do this. We we wanted to convince the audience that that you know ultimately what this show is about is we, we spend as much time as we felt like we need to convince the audience of a certain truth and then reveal that truth not to be true. <laughs> so we we want and that's and that it's just a, that's just the fun. I mean, I have to say this show was a lot of fun to write because of the and 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 also you know direct as well. But but it was you know like we just felt like what do we have to do to convince the audience that his dad is dead what tools are they used to the flashbacks and the sort of the angst and the sort of visual language and uh, storytelling devices do we how many of these do we have to deploy to convince them that he's dead and then he's alive and that you know and we what we wanted the goal of this show was to engage the audience in the game you know the fun of the of the of the storytelling um because i think audiences are pretty sophisticated you know so many stories. I think we found that out in This Is Us. You know, they were it was, here's like sort of this sort of you know weepy family drama. But uh, Dan took such great liberties with the timeline to hide reveals and 
things like that. And audiences were there. And that audience, you know, that audience, a large part of that audience was, you know, all over the board. There were young people, but there was also old people who watched the show and they just rolled with it. There was no confusion. And we said, boy, American audiences are ready to have some fun. So that's what this show, <laughs> kind of what this show is. Right, right. There is, like you're saying, there is so much respect for the audience's intelligence. And I think also even just that thing in, in terms of how we consume media and the ability to kind of go back and rewatch allows you to lay a lot more Easter eggs and a lot more information and, and textures into the narrative. And so what are some of the elements that you feel like have really ended up in the, the structure of the story or the way that you've told it from that fact that what you're saying, you really want to kind of like speak very directly to the audience with a lot of respect for the intelligence of the viewing experience. So what's the question? Like, what, <laughs> what are some of the elements that ended up in the show because of wanting oh. to make sure that that was how you were communicating? Well, I, you know, I think I think it's just, every, you know, all the characters have secrets. So that's that's one thing. And then we, we like to play with trying to put stuff out in plain sight uh, because we've noticed in many uh, the films that we've done that you can sort of tell the truth uh, visually, uh, uh, but because of people's expectations about archetypes and, and cliche, they're 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 viewing it one way, and then once it's revealed that that it's uh, 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 that it's uh, it was mis misdirection or a late reveal of the truth, uh, you can go back and look at those things and and see that it was right in front of your face the whole time. Or he, oh, he never actually did say his, you know, his dad. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's, there's like an inertia to narrative, you know? It has like this iner this directional inertia and audience is sort of like, oh, I'm on that inertia. And you can kind of hide things in plain sight because they're on that trajectory. And they, and, and you know, it, they don't really, it doesn't really occur to them. But, you know, we knew they were sophisticated and we knew that modern audiences are more sophisticated than people give them credit for. And I knew we knew that if we if we revealed another truth, they would be with us. We, you know, and we, you know, so that was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I, I love I love that idea of the the kind of playfulness with the audience, kind of like the cat and mouse game in terms yeah. of the story as well. Um, and I, well, I, I mean, you know, know, I have to say uh, Knives Out had a big influence on us because that 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 movie and and that's sort of those drawing room uh we're, this that's a different world and he's playing in that agatha christie world in a sort of elevated way but uh we, we were like well why can't we do that in the espionage world you know why can't we play with the audience um and uh so i mean it's just like and 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 engage them and with uh, in the game and the fun of it all and I, I've heard you both talk a little bit about how you did a lot of research specifically into the science of manipulation and, and you know, even just the idea of like, well, how does a magician distract you from doing a trick so you don't realize the mechanics of how it's coming together? And so what were some of the aspects that were really helpful as you were structuring some of the storylines from having done that research at the beginning for you both? Yeah, we, we, we uh, for our, our film, well, actually, we have a history of kind of con artists in, fil in our, our work, but... Uh, uh, for our first film, I Love You, Philip Morris, uh, we did a lot of research in the cons. And then uh, for uh, a subsequent film uh, called Focus, uh, we did a lot of research into the neuroscience of deception. And uh, it had started, I don't know why it took so long for us this to occur to us, but, uh, you know, what we do is the same thing. And, uh, you know, and there's a, there's a famous experiment uh, uh, in the in neuroscience world called the uh, the was it the dancing gorilla mm -hmm. and uh, and it's just a you know it's a it's a it's a locked off frame and there's all this stuff going on and somebody's talking to you and they're you know they're they're uh narrating something you think it's about one thing and then at the end the, the end they say and i bet you didn't even notice the dancing gorilla and you go what and then you rewind and you look and the whole time he's been talking there's been a dance guy in a gorilla suit dancing in the background and uh and you know that's true in film. You know, as, as when you edit a film, you know that people are always looking at the eyes of the actors. It's just where we go as human beings, always. So you can always sneak something in, uh, and people are with the character; they're not necessarily with the image. Uh, so that that becomes the basis of a lot of misdirection. And and similarly, I know you were you were also looking into you know 
companies that work within corporate es- corporate espionage um and was you know it's it's such a fascinating world to de- delve into and what were some of the the linear threads or details that you started to see across the board as you were doing more research that you felt were interesting well, aspects to carry over into the show that's a great question I, I i mean it was you know i think the big one was the 2016 election and how the uh russians were deploying uh social media to um you know move the electorate and and move the populace in this way or the other and we were like you know we've spent a lot of time in our career discussing how people's people do this on an individual level but we kind of history sort of threw in our face it happening on a sort of nationwide global level so uh you know and all the all all these you know I mean you can Glenn can speak to this a little better than I can but yeah I mean it was all all these things sort of history sort of came to our aid <laughs> yeah deception um you know a mass deception you know it's always been that kind of the tool of governments and if you have control of the the media uh you know it started with print with printing press you know and, and fake things printed and then in television was a huge or film was a huge leap forward and television even more so because it was in every home and uh and if you have control of that media but now for the first time in history for very little money, you can make a huge impact. So it doesn't need to just be, you know, you don't need a television studio and actors and all these things. You could, you know, just a well-placed image that gets goes viral can do a lot of damage. And it's not to say that anybody's even on anybody's side in any of this. It's 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 just a way to sow chaos and and distrust in institutions. And the show is headed in that direction. Um, eventually that um uh you know the 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 net result of all of this uh is you know sowing uh distrust uh in the populace so that they don't know what to believe I also wanted to ask you both a a little bit about the tone of the show because um it sounds like that's a space where you kind of really enjoy the the playfulness that you're able to have in a show like this where you know you've got the the kind of like high tension stakes of of espionage at the same time there's a lot of kind of interpersonal family drama between you know John and his dad and kind of what does their relationship look like the fact that you've got a central character doing trying to overcome himself. There's kind of a budding romance starting to happen as well, potentially. Um, and all those things at play really meld together in a really cohesive way. And so how did you approach kind of figuring out not even just like the singular tone of the show, but if we're going to be playful and we're going to kind of go in these different directions as well at the same time, how do we make sure that it always comes together in a way that feels very much all part of the same show? Well, I mean, we we early on when we were we said this is a great luxury actually because you're telling human drama uh, in a world where nobody there's no reality, there's no truth, and there's no trust, and and it's hard. You know, relationships are based on trust, and and so it's it the the fun of trying to have people work out their shit in <laughs> in in this world where who knows where the truth lies it's just it was just a, a delight and so we we we, were, we loved the challenge we loved the the playful notes we knew that we knew the actors were going to love it too we just said oh god the actors are going to love this sort of stuff because who knows you know um and uh and who knows where the truth lies so yeah it was it was it was it was really a pleasure and and you know when you're doing human relations and that's what we're talking about to us that's humor uh, we just feel like we've just found um over time that you know interpersonal relationships are so based on humor shared humor finding moments of humor obviously not jokes but like you know character humor that that kind of stuff is uh what what how our relationships are i you know i uh and you know these are just things we've learned over the course of our career but it's like you know if you show a couple falling in love and they make each other laugh it's it's more it means more to the audience than them going to bed together it it has more meaning for an audience to to see two people tickling each other's funny bone and really getting each other and being goofy together all whatever it is and 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 also life is absurd and funny and all of us deal with the absurdity and funniness of life all every day so that that just makes it real so like you know you can suddenly go from this sort of elevated espionage 
you know, like, you know, uh, where the truth is, who knows where the truth is, and you know, there's all these mysteries, and then you have, like, people, a dad and a father arguing over turkey bacon, you know, I mean, that, I mean, that's the kind of, that's just the reality of where we want to be. We didn't want to, like, ignore, because all these movies can be a little cool, I think, in this, the, the, the model for these are the 70s espionage movies, and they can be a little cool, and, and uh, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to have warm, you know, warm sort of character show. I and mean, I, th- I think that's such a great point as well, that intimacy can come in so many different forms that isn't about the, the physicality. And with John and Haley and scenes together, it's even just the idea of either of them trusting the other one even a little bit is such a unique form of intimacy for these two characters with their backgrounds. And so how did you find those those lines and spaces of, you know, you kind of, you don't want John to suddenly let his guard down completely and tell her everything, but you want him to kind of give her little pieces here and there to kind of show the, the building intimacy between them. And so how did you find that dance of how much are they each going to give each other when and kind of what does this look like? Well, it was always a challenge uh, to figure out we always knew it would have to come in dribs and drabs and we uh, sort of, uh, you know, you would have to kind of write yourself into a corner and then figure out like, oh, well, how's he going to ever, you know, trust her? You know, she saves his life. Well, is that enough? It's not, it's, it's a start, you know, but it's not necessarily everything. So it's a long journey that they go on and, and, um, and it probably is one that will, would be a constant problem, I think, going forward. Yeah. And there's a handoff that happens. John had one person he trusted in his whole his whole life because he because of his he has this sort of ability to um, part of what makes him great at his job um, makes it, it makes it hard for him to develop relationships. He's ruined marriages and he's never been able. To, but he's had one friend who sort of got him, and that friend in the pilot jumps off a building. <laughs> so so the season is really about him trying to find someone who can be that person to fill that role. And the season is about once he finds that person who can fill that role uh, and maybe even more so um, he's healed. And that allows, you know, then we, and then that sort of leads to the the climax or, you know, he's beginning to be healed. So that's, 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 that was the journey that we plotted out from the very beginning. And not to get too much away. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm sure that that's always the delicate dance is never giving too yeah, much yeah. when talking about it. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of, of Valence, uh, Jason Butler Horner's character, um, you know, we, we kind of, we see the loss firsthand at the beginning, but there's so many intricate moments where that comes back to John and, in, you know, the introspection of revisiting that moment influences him a lot in the present. And so how do you find those key moments narratively for him as a character of, you know, based on where he's at right now, this feels like a moment that he would kind of sit and wallow in that a little bit more or because of all of this around him, he's looking for more answers or he's asking more questions about this because there's all those kind of moments where we kind of see him in the quiet moments in between or we see the flashback sequence of him replaying it in his mind a lot. Yeah. I mean, obviously, yeah, that, that wasn't part of the plan. Uh, and the fact that I, I think part of the front of the show is seeing... um is revisiting stuff and seeing what what went wrong and what went right and you know and the fact that that in any given scene and any given episode you know um weir might be ahead of us or behind uh behind the action um you know is he pursued or is he you know, pursuing and 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 they there still is the plan that they're holding together and they're adapting on the fly and and to be able to uh, revisit those moments and see like, oh, okay, I see what they meant to do. It's very confusing at first, but we, we I, I have several uh, episodes so far and a couple to come. We, we, we still revise that moment um, and why he did what he did. And what you're touching upon there as well is such an interesting facet in terms of the writing of writing a character who's very frequently several steps ahead of everyone else. And, you know, he's the smartest person in the room. And so when you're working on any particular scene with him, are you kind of always in your minds thinking and looking a few pages ahead in the script, you know, even if you haven't written those moments of, okay, his he's working towards this thing that's going to happen five pages from now and other people will catch up to him then because you've kind of got to be proactively thinking about where he's moving and, and how far ahead he is of the other characters. Yeah, I'd say that because it's the directors, it's more of a challenge. And for the actors, it's more of a challenge. For the writers, it's not quite, because it's just- yeah. 
It's yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky, but from, from our, we had all eight shows. We knew exactly where everything was going and, and uh, in outline form at least. Um, so the actors could ask us the questions. Um, but you know, they, you know, when they're playing a certain per- perception, uh, they would sometimes have trouble, like in early episodes when they're playing a per- certain perception, which they know, they know the actor knows that their character knows that that's not true. And, but they have to play that reality in a way to convince the audience that it's, that the reality we're trying to convince the audience about is true. So God, this is, gets confusing. And, and they would have, you know, so it's a tiny little target, you know, it's like, if you go too far this way, it'll just be, you're just cheating and the audience will hate you for it. Or if you go too far that way, it won't be convincing. You won't be delivering the, the, the sort of the the reality that you're trying to create at that moment and so um it was tricky you know and and so you you we just there's lots of times to talk talking about it a lot on set you know and 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 ultimately i think what we did is we just got versions you know we would just say let's do this version let's do that version let's do and we figured it out in the editing room you know and and speaking of directing as well um i believe it's episodes one two three and eight that that you both directed as well and so I wanted to ask about setting up the visual language for a show like this, because it's got such a specific and thoughtfully crafted look and feel to it. And even just kind of the hues of lighting and, and the specific color palette that we kind of start to experience a lot in the show. And then you've got these very different worlds of kind of corporate and high tech spaces against like an isolated remote cabin in the woods. Um, and so I was really interested in how you came up with a lot of the different aesthetics of the language visually. Well, you know, a, a lot of it was kind of harkening back to the 70s films and there's a lot of uh, iso- you know, themes of isolation. And uh, so there's a muted color palette, uh, which was big because of the film stocks of the day. And and then um, and this kind of, uh, uh, you know, shadow play and, and, you know, hard to see faces, you know, because we're as the audience are trying to figure out you know what they're really saying or what they're who they really are uh and a lot of like lonely wide angle frames uh to show the isolation of the character so uh you know we definitely wanted to use the visual language of of a uh, espionage show or movie uh and then play within that palette uh with other things like comedy and stuff that you don't normally see and I've heard you both speak a little bit about how the importance of, of having a lot of creative decisions made before you even step on set, whether you're directing that episode or whether you're, you're you know, purely there as like writers and showrunners and producers. What are some of the most important things for you to make sure that you've decided upon or made as decisions before you walk onto set each day when you're making a show like this? I always find it's like what you're, we, you know, the biggest thing you don't want is to show up and disagree in front of the actors because it just creates confusion and and distrust frankly uh so we always try to say like you know this is what we're doing today right you know like <laughs> uh but as as uh um um and, and and the same goes for a lot of your key uh crew you know you 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 really want to just have a, some of those arguments uh or discussions up front about even if it's obvious i always find that we always just have to do a, re- a quick recap before meeting yeah I found, I found I don't know about you, Glenn. I think you too, but I, I found myself on this one more than any other thing we've ever done. Acting out the story, <laughs> you know, like doing a lot of like on set or in the on the mixing stage with the editors, you know, like like you know, doing things like you know, and the audience thinks this, and we're going down here, and we don't know about that, and you know, like really like acting out the because the everybody kind of had the knowledge of including the studio executive everybody had knowledge of what was going to where we were headed and so it, it would constantly pollute them and you you would in in order to bring them back to this current reality you would have to do i would have to do a little, <laughs> a little pantomime i found myself doing it a lot because i ultimately i found it was just the best way to convey um you know because- you could talk about you could talk about it until you blew in the face but if you just, you know, if you just do like a little emotive, like, you know, if you just basically say, take the take the the role of the audience member and where they are and just portray where their their emotional experience at that moment, 
you could like the, then the actors and every, the DP and everybody would be like, oh, OK, I get it. You know, because otherwise, if you just, yeah, you could go until you blew in your face. You know, I remember there was a tricky shot in our first movie and I was talking to Ewan McGregor. And and, uh, and he would he would I would explain explain what was going on. He was like, could you I don't I didn't get it. Could you do it again? And I would explain it again. And he goes, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying. And I was just like, you're scared. He's like, okay. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, I also, you know, we did this thing very early on because uh, there's so much misdirection and so much uh, deception going on that we told the crew and the cast and everybody, because uh, you, you know, sometimes you make mistakes in this. In, when you're writing a script and you, you know you use the wrong word or whatever and in a show like this people take everything at face you know what's on the page it's very important what's on the page so we just kept saying you know if there you have any question whatsoever you know no question is too dumb or point out the obvious all the time because we we don't want to make one of those mistakes where we all miss something we, there was something i can't remember off the top of my head right now what it was but we missed something major because we all assumed it was true and uh, then we had to go back and uh you know it wasn't until the editing room where we were like oh shit <laughs> we have to fix that you know <laughs> fortunately it was something we could fix with some dialogue but it was uh... I love it you know and, and and talking of editing as well because with what you've both been saying about the intentional misdirects as well and even just when you go back and look at certain information once reveals have happened you kind of read it differently the second time were there any particular moments or scenes where you had to really play around and and finesse the idea of how much information you were giving away in a scene in terms of editing as you were going through post-production yeah, yeah. i think it was yeah go ahead oh. Well, I think we found out on, on on This Is Us, there's like a big reveal at the end of the pilot of that uh, show where we thought it was very obvious that we told everybody that, oh, no, we weren't, we're not in modern day, we're in 1973 or whatever, whatever year it was. And, um, and people weren't getting it. And, uh, and we thought it was obvious. And you really have to like, like, show three shots that do the reveal instead of just one. And uh, and then on this one, because we did so much of that, um, there were some times where you're like, oh, we don't need all this. We cut a bunch of stuff down. And then there was times where we would we would go, no, nah, we're going to need to do that. This is us. We really need to like harp on this for a few shots, uh, so people really understand what's going on. And uh, it was, but it was trial and error, I think mostly. I like that. That's become the code name for we need a couple more shots and reveals. <laughs> yeah, we need a this is us right now. <laughs> And and lastly, in in terms of of going back to what you were talking about earlier, with you know having John Weir go through this very internalized journey with himself and and essentially trying to overcome a lot of the damage of his past, how did you find the balance or the the line of how far do we want to carry that journey of him being able to overcome small obstacles within himself? Um, against the fact that you obviously don't want him to completely heal himself. You want to have a lot of richness to play with in the future. And also it's very realistic to human nature. You know, you don't suddenly solve everything overnight. It's a very gradual and slow process. And so how did you find yeah. how far you wanted to carry that in, in season one with him? Well, ultimately we wanted um, it to be a complete season and feel like a movie, you know, uh, and end in a satisfying way. Um, and next season will be new damage. <laughs> um, you know, cause I, I don't think a guy like him ever heals entirely, but we do want to feel like he took a big first step towards being a healed person. And, uh, and the way that you would at the end of a movie, you know, that personal growth leads to resolution of the story um and that, that you know you close the arc and that and i think that's you know we really wanted to do that we 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 feel like um I, and we think it's a vestige of old uh tv storytelling when you did 24 shows or 22 shows uh in this is us they did 18 where you have to kind of keep things a little open and and uh but i don't think we really you need to because i think there's a way to reset um uh, in the second season the third season to give the characters new uh, new damage. <laughs> I love that. Well, I'm really looking forward to watching the last couple of episodes of, of the season. It's been such a joy to watch the, the first six. So thank you so much to both of you for talking about this. I really appreciate your time today. Oh, our pleasure. Our pleasure.